Hi there, it's Ian here, and you're watching Grumpy Opinions, the show where I'm going to tell you all about what I think of films, TV shows, games, and life in general. Outlander is the historical time-travelling drama about Claire Fraser and her family, living in pre-revolutionary America and getting embroiled in all sorts of shenanigans. Episode 7, The Ballad of Roger Mack, kicks off in Hillsborough, where Roger and Brianna are playing with wee Jimmy, and they're both trying to shake off a case of the morbs before he goes off to war. But I'm sure this little game of spot the stiff won't really matter. Wink wink, foreshadow. Meanwhile, Jimmy and Claire have an altogether more cheerful reminisce in life, since it's Big Jim's 50th birthday that day, and he's still hale, hearty, and ready for a bit of a roll in the hay. But soon enough, everybody's out in the field together, and Jimmy starts handing out cockades to his men to tell the friend from foe on the battlefield. And then Isaiah turns up, and of course that kicks off tensions between him and the Browns, who are still across at him about everything that happened with their daughter. But things calm down a bit and everyone starts to see the reason, if you think so. And if you can't see where this subplot is going, you've got to be as blind as Jocasta. Anyway, a letter arrives from the regulators asking for a parlay, and Tryon's like, well, we'll let you know by tomorrow, because he's pretty much set on having a big fight. And shortly afterwards, Brianna arrives to tell him that she's actually just remembered that Alamance was where a big battle happened, and that she remembered that it goes badly for the regulators. But she's also sure that it pretty much has to happen, because otherwise the War of Independence might not kick off. Still, because Jamie and Claire don't read enough sci-fi, they think they can still stop it, so they send Roger because he's the only one that can deliver the message secretly. So Jamie gives him a French surrender hanky, and he toots off across the creek to find Murta, giving his men like a rousing speech that night. But he explains things to Murta, and he's put in a difficult spot because Murta's men want to fight and so does he, but he also doesn't want everyone to die for no reason. So the next morning, Tryon's reply arrives, and it's a big hard no, and so a fight there's going to be. So Roger trots back off, but on his way home he manages to bump into Murag Mackenzie. Yeah, remember her? She was the girl that he managed to save from Bonnet's piracy back when they were on the boat on the way across the sea. And he begs her to get her family away and gives her a big goodbye hug, and unfortunately his time is really rubbish because her grumpy husband turns up and oh my god, it's the Saint of Killers. No, I'm just kidding. It's Graham McTavish in a brown wig and he's playing Buck, and he's got the same temperament as Dougal did, and things invariably lead to like a bit of a punch-up, and of course because Roger's rubbish he ends up losing. But in the scrap, his cockade falls out, and then he gets knocked out. Oh no. And back at the camp, there's no more time because Tryon's gearing up for battle, and he tells Jamie that he should put on his fetching new coat, and Jamie's like, well, this is awkward. But still, he pops it on, because what's he going to do? And the battle commences, and it's really more of a rout than a fight, and the Reds are just kind of like doing some pretty naff guerrilla tactics, and the militia end up storming in and chasing them all down. And Jamie, you know, as you'd expect, he wades right into the thick of things, but wouldn't you know, he's safe because he's got plot armour. But he bumps right into that guy from the prison. I mean, I think it's that guy. Anyway, it's a guy he knows. And the guy isn't for, like, calming down. And he's just about to shoot Jamie when Murta comes and cold cocks him. But then Murta ends up getting Omar'd by, like, a wee laddie who's following Jamie's advice. And it's bad, and it looks like his liver's all sort of spurty, and they have a wee moment together. And then Murta slips away, but not quite. But then he slips away. And then Jamie's in shock and gets his buds to carry Murts all the way back to the medical tent, by which time he looks pretty deader than dead man dead. And Claire's like, sweetie, just maybe not. And then emotional Jim heads outside to be greeted by the gloat and try on. And amazingly, he manages not to plant him where he stands, but instead gives him a bit of a tongue lashing. And he throws the coat to the ground and stalks off to the fire site to crouch down and have himself a wee cry. And he's not the only one having issues, because Bree's upset because she can't find Roger. In fact, nobody's seen him at all and they wander around till they eventually come across a hanging tree full of executed regulators. And lo and behold, one of the corpses has a French surrender hanky poking out of the pocket. Could it be him? Is that Roger Mack? Has he sung his last pop song? I don't know, I guess we'll find out next week. So what did I think? Well, this was one of the big series things we've been building up to. I mean, the whole of season five, like with the Jamie and Murta situation, the militia and the regulators, and the whole thing about Jamie's wavering between duty and honour and between the love of his godfather and the safety of the people on the ridge. I mean, I think they played like a lot of really good little internal moments of that brilliantly. I mean, this episode was full of great little moments, especially between like Jamie and Tryon. And, you know, I also think there was some really good standout work between Sam Hewen and Tim Downey. I mean, just the little choices the actor made, like stuff like how Jamie reacts to being told to wear the red coat and like look on his face. And then that bit at the end when he tosses it down, and Tryon's hand moves just a wee bit as if for a second he's forgotten himself and he was going to go and pick it up. But then he doesn't because, you know, he's aristocracy. And then like how Sam handles the crying scene beside the campfire. And that's obviously a hark back to episode one in the moment when he released Murta from his vow. I mean, that's nice bit of visual symmetry there as well as being thematic. Although I totally did call that back at the time, if you remember. It's also good to see some action. I mean, yeah, I'm a guy. I like my war stories. And obviously I've been hoping for something interesting when it came to this battle. 
And Outland has always tried to do something a bit different with the battle scenes. I mean, we had Culloden's flashback snippets of Total Carnage and like that misty morning confusion of pressing pans. And now we've got this tree line guerrilla warfare style stuff. And it's probably kind of fitting considering that like Alamance is supposed to be a one-sided slaughter. And they probably didn't want to go like fool the last samurai and just reenact the full of light brigade over a big field with people falling over. And I liked the way that they did it. You know, there was a lot of sort of like firing out of the bushes and stuff and bits where like the cannon was like hitting the trees and that kind of reminded me of the Battle of Bastogne from Band of Brothers. I also really liked that they brought back Graham McTavish. And like, you know, the sneaky wee moment where Jamie like mentioned Dougal, because I thought that was just a callback to Culloden, but actually it was also a clever little hint that they were going to have Dougal's laddie appearing. Since, yeah, I mean, presumably Buck is actually Dougal's son by way of Gellis Duncan. Now, like, that's that kind of show, so uh, there's usually a family connection somewhere. And it was also a really good idea to get Graham McTavish back. I mean, obviously, you know, they've done that before. I mean, they did all this stuff with Tobias Menzies. And I don't know if it was just good makeup and lighting or if they did like a, a digital de-age on him, but he looked really young. And I suppose the wig and the beard kind of helps cover up a multitude of sins. But yeah, no, he just kind of looked young and healthy. And we had that nice scene of like Jamie and Claire, you know, by the river and it felt kind of naturalistic, even though it didn't really drive the plot. I mean, there was the other good one in the bed in the morning. Again, didn't really drive the plot. I mean, that's one of the reasons I never mentioned like in the recap, the bit of the river scene, because it wasn't actually essential to the ongoing plot of the episode. It was character moments, character stuff. But also, I mean, you know, the episode also had some nice moments with Claire and Brianna together and they did okay with what they were given. But I think it was just okay. But yeah, that's one of my issues of this week. I feel like there was a bit of a sidelining of some characters. I mean, partly that's in order to facilitate the book events, but also tie in this whole Murta Jamie scenario. And I think that the mix caused problems this week. I mean, because we've got this weird contrast of things going on, meaning that after the first scene, there wasn't really an awful lot for like Brianna to do. And also like, after a while, what was the point in Claire? I mean, she wasn't really doing much in the show. I'll come back to that later. But also, why is Brianna the one with Claire instead of Parsley? I mean, where was where was she? Was she minding the ridge? I mean, I would presume maybe. But the show went to such great lengths to show earlier in the season that Brianna hates being around blood and guts. And now it just forgets that because we need somebody to be there. I mean, think about the logic. Before she appeared, because she was meant to be staying in Hillsborough, who was meant to be helping Claire? There wasn't anybody else I saw that. I, mean, I didn't see any another assistant. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but you would expect there'd be somebody there and you would think that would be Parsley because she is the trained assistant. And also, speaking of that, where's Fungus? I mean, by rights, he's the one guy who should have actually been on both sides of this fight shooting at himself, but he wasn't on either. He just wasn't even in the episode as far as I could tell. But since he's both a regulator and a militiaman, it would have made sense if he had been there because he's the one guy who could have taken maybe a letter to Murtaugh from them. And, you know, since he's known to both sides... But the show, obviously, he doesn't know about the time travel, so they probably wouldn't want to put that in. And it makes more sense to send Roger because he could actually convince him. But they could have just sent a letter with somebody like Fergus. And the show has totally glossed over the fact that Fergus actually led a jailbreak in the town where he lives last season. And yet somehow nobody seems to remember that. He never got in any trouble. Like the people, the guards outside there somehow didn't recognise like the very recognisably handsome French guy who lives in that town. And, you know, somehow he manages to mingle with both the militia and the regulators and nobody notices and nobody seems to care. I mean, so that whole thing has just bugged me, right? The whole Fergus on both sides thing has really bugged me this season. Anyway, back back to this week. The problem I felt is like, for example, that Claire was kind of irrelevant this week as soon as like they'd had that scene with like her and Jamie at the Riverside. I mean, I presume that stuff that's from the book, like these little bits of conversation. But the rest of it, it's all we really saw was her being sad at dead Murta with his digitally timed out coloured face. What I mean by that is, look, look at how dead he looks. That's a really good technique. What they do is they go on a computer and they actually time the colour out of the face. Anyway, a little bit of trivia. The other thing in this was the whole thing about Isaiah. Now, yeah, she was there to like have a look at Isaiah and for like the syringe to be broken. But as the second Isaiah appeared up at the muster at the beginning, like, if you didn't know where that was going, you've obviously never read a book, you've never seen a TV show, you've never seen a film, you've never been at a play, because it was so obvious, clumsy, and it was blatant that he was going to get shot in his back by his own guys. I mean, could these guys have been any less believable here? And I don't mean the actors, by the way, but, you know, the characters are so obviously pretending that everything's okay. And it just makes Jamie look like an idiot, because surely he'd realise these guys are going to, like, shoot his eye in the back the first chance they get. And also, like... Somebody having a grudge against somebody but on the same side and then in a battle like shooting them is such a tired cliche. I mean, it gets rolled out in so many historical dramas. I mean, God, even Sharp did it once. I mean, he literally shot the Prince of Orange because he was getting all his dudes killed at Waterloo. But not only that, we've got Claire who's now an expert in powder burns. I mean, is she Dexter now? 
Is she going to be analysing blood splatter patterns next? And the whole scene and plotline felt really contrived. I mean, it felt contrived partly because it felt like the whole situation only existed so that they could break the syringe. And like to make sure that we know that the Browns are bad man bads. Now, just in case that wasn't apparent from the guys that they cast and the way they act, and the fact that they've been total horrors when they first appear. I mean, it's a rubbish and rushed payoff for them. I mean, just considering that like, they appear the other week and now they've shot his eye and they're buggering off. And the war's over, so presumably you wouldn't see them again. Although considering the fact that they also broke Claire's syringe and insulted her, and they aren't dead and didn't get beaten up or shot or something, I assume they're going to pop up again so that Jamie can punch them in the face or something, because in some ways this show and these books are really predictable, and people who are bad to Claire always get their comeuppance. And speaking about villains, I feel like the show's taken a bit of a misstep. And looking at the whole thing, right, the murder situation could have been utilised a lot better, because the show clearly wants to try and make a big thing out of him and Jamie having different views on things and being on opposite sides, and there was a great opportunity there to have a hero versus like antagonist between him and Jamie. Now, a classic sort of two friends who end up falling out and on different sides of the same conflict. I mean, come on, if you've seen my Westworld reviews, that's basically the route they've been going down. I mean, they're doing that with Dolores and Maeve. And, you know, it's like the classic X-Men thing with, like, Professor X and Magneto. And the whole thing is just like Martin Luther versus Malcolm X. I mean, it's classic stuff. And it works really well. And yeah, sure, it's cliched a little bit, but, you know, it, it works as well. But this time... You know, they've got this idea of where there's these two guys, like-minded good people with different approaches to the problem. But unfortunately, the nature of this show, combined with the books and the fact that the storyline's been crowbarred in, means that I felt like the shows didn't take the time to actually do this properly. I mean, so all we got was a couple of scenes and then suddenly, oops, oh, it's over, he's dead. And I'm kind of sad to see Murta go out this way. And I, I didn't really feel moved by it. Although, you know, I have no issues with Duncan LaCroix's performance itself. I just, I felt there could have been a lot more to this. It felt a little bit cheap and rushed. And then, you know, if it was different, it, sure, it would be a different show and a different story. But I'm kind of siding with the book readers who said that they should have just ditched the character of Murta back at Ardsmuir. Because, frankly, they just haven't really done enough with him. And, yeah, again, I'm not cribbing on, like, the fact that he's had some really good scenes, especially the stuff between him and Jocasta. I mean, that's been some really good stuff. Also, it doesn't help that Murta's death scene felt like it was cobbled together from a load of other bits from famous movies and shows. I mean, follow me here. Platoon. Game of Thrones. Lord of the Rings. Hmm. But finally... We need to talk about Roger. Now, we know Roger's an idiot. Roger's a terrible character. He's an awful idiot. He does stupid things all the time. And he doesn't actually make sense even within the context of his own character. Because he's a professor, but he's also a moron. And he only seems to know things when it's convenient, and then he doesn't when it's not. He's not very well written. And, yeah, his stupidity has again managed to get him into trouble for the umpteenth time. And why do I say trouble? Because I don't believe for a second he's dead. And here's how I know that. Because even just looking at the basic filmmaking and stylistic choices in this, as well as other factors outside the show, there's no way in hell he's actually dead. Because to begin with, you don't throw away two main characters in a single episode in a show. I mean, sure, it happened on something like The Red Wedding, or in the big finale of a final season of something. But Murta wasn't in the books until this point, so theoretically, yeah, they might have killed off Roger. But the way this was set up and shot... I think that's either not him hanging there, it's just some other dude who didn't like wiping his nose on his sleeve, or somehow he survived being hanged. And I'm going to tell you exactly why. Because one, we haven't seen his face, so it might not be him. And even if it is, he might not be dead. Because if you, they wanted to show him dead, they would show the body and show that he's very much dead. Two, one of his hands is up as his neck. And I've never seen anybody in a movie or film with their hands up at the neck during a hanging, other than maybe Back to the Future 3. And the reason being is because if you can get your hands to your neck, you can probably stop yourself from being properly strangled, at least if you're rescued, rescued in time. So the fact that he's like that suggests that he's not dead. And three, the show jumped up to this in such a weird, slow, clunky way that if it had been a death reveal, it would have been more surprising, more sudden, more sharp and less obvious. I mean, the show is like, where's Roger? Where's Roger? Where's Roger? Where's Roger? Where's Roger? Where's Roger? Oh, look, a bunch of hanged dudes. Where's Roger? Where's Roger? Oh, no, a hanky. I mean, come on, it's kind of cat-handed this week. And four, 
Because Richard Rankin has been posting daily on Instagram during the lockdown, and he's still got his Roger hair and beard. And that's after how many months of like the show being in the can? So, I'm sorry, if he's keeping the look, it's because he's coming back next season. And actors don't bother keeping the look of something like that, you know. I mean, if this was the end of lockdown and his hair had grown that long, fine. But no, he's he's never changed his hair, so that means Roger Mack isn't dead. Now, I might be wrong, and frankly, if I'm wrong, fair enough, but I don't see it, that's how I feel. And I don't feel this was a bad episode, not a terrible one. And I'm glad that we're out the other side of this whole regulator stramash, because now the show might get into some kind of solid storyline for the latter half of the season. I mean, Outlander's quite often done seasons in halves, um, but now we've got the inevitable vengeance coming up on the Browns, we've got the inevitable vengeance on the Bonnet, and the inevitable vengeance on Buck McKenzie as well. So there's literally everything to play for. So there's loads of roads they can go down, and some of them they can tease into the season after. But yeah, that's how I felt about this. So before I go, remember you can join the Facebook group, you can follow me on Twitter, as well as on the Patreon. And remember, like, I've got other show reviews, I've just finished watching Picard this weekend and put up a massive review of the finale. So yeah, I'll try and get some other different content as well, because I'm just down to two shows a week now, Outlander and Westworld. So the next couple of weeks, maybe you'll see something new. But other than that, stay safe, stay inside, keep healthy, and take care of yourselves. And until next time, I've been Ian, and these have been my grumpy opinions.